a reading from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Objectification is a notion central to feminist theory. It can be roughly defined as the seeing and or treating a person, usually a woman, as an object. In this entry, the focus is primarily on sexual objectification, objectification occurring in the sexual realm. Martha Nussbaum has identified seven features that are involved in the area of treating a person as an object. Instrumentality, the treatment of a person as a tool for the objectifier's purposes. Denial of autonomy, the treatment of a person as lacking in autonomy and self-determination. Inertness, the treatment of a person as lacking in agency and perhaps also in activity. Fungibility, the treatment of a person as interchangeable with other objects. Violability, the treatment of a person as lacking in boundary integrity. Ownership, the treatment of a person as something that is owned by another and can be bought or sold. Denial of subjectivity, the treatment of a person as something whose feelings and experiences, if any, need not be taken into account. Ray Langton has added three more features to Nussbaum's list. Reduction to body, the treatment of a person as identified with their body or body parts. Reduction to appearance, the treatment of a person primarily in terms of how they look or how they appear to the senses. Silencing, the treatment of a person as if they are silent, lacking the capacity to speak. It has been pointed out by some feminist thinkers that women in our society are more identified and associated with their bodies than are men, and, to a greater extent than men, they are valued for how they look. In order to gain social acceptability, women are under constant pressure to correct their bodies and appearance more generally, and make them conform to the ideals of feminine appearance of their time, so-called norms of feminine appearance, the standards of appearance that women feel they should be living up to. Some feminists have argued that, in being preoccupied with their looks, women treat themselves as things to, to be decorated and gazed upon. Barkey believes that women in patriarchal societies also undergo a kind of fragmentation by being too closely identified with their body. Their entire being is identified with the body, a thing which has been regarded as less inherently human than the mind or personality. All the focus is placed on a woman's body in a way that her mind or personality are not adequately acknowledged. A woman's person, then, is fragmented. Barkey believes that through this fragmentation, a woman is objectified because her body is separated from her person and is thought as representing the woman. The adolescent girl becomes an object and sees herself as an object. She discovers this new aspect of her being with surprise. It seems to her that she has been doubled. Instead of coinciding exactly with herself, she now begins to exist outside. However, this stranger who inhabits women's consciousness, Barkey writes, is hardly a stranger. It is, rather, the woman's own self. Barkey talks about the disciplinary practices that produce a feminine body and are the practices through which women learn to see themselves as objects. First of all, according to her, there are those practices that aim to produce a body of a certain size and shape. Women must conform to the body ideal of their time, i.e. a slim body with large breasts, which, Barkey holds, requires women to subject their bodies to the tyranny of slenderness, put themselves through constant dieting and exercise. According to Barkey, the second category of these disciplinary practices that produce a more feminine body are those that aim to control the body's gestures, postures, and movements. Women, she holds, are more restricted than men in the way they move and the way they, they try to make, take up very little space as opposed to men who tend to expand the space available. Women's movements are also restrained by their uncomfortable clothes and shoes. The final category of the disciplinary practices, Barkey holds, are those that are directed toward the display of a woman's body as an ornamented surface. Women must take care of their skin and make it soft, smooth, hairless, and wrinkle-free. They must apply makeup to disguise their skin's imperfections. Our culture demands the infantilization of women's bodies and faces. The sexualization of girls and the infantilization of adult women are two sides of the same coin. They both tell us that we should find youth, inexperience, and naivete sexy in women, but not in men. This reinforces a power and status difference between men and women, where vulnerability, weakness, and dependency on their opposites are gendered traits, desirable in one sex, but not the other. Childlike features, Gould argues, inspire a need to nurture. When we see a living creature with babyish features, he writes, we feel an automatic surge of a disarming tenderness. 
Allison Guy observes that we see a similar trend in recent toy makeovers. Larger eyes, bigger heads, fatter, stumpier limbs. But we see this primarily in toys aimed at infants and girls, not boys. Guy interprets this threat trend as the result of a cultural imperative for women to embody both the cute and the sexual. So women don cute clothes with colorful patterns associated with children and wear flippy skirts and baby doll t-shirts. They wear eyeliner to give the illusion of the large eyes of childhood, foundation to hide the marks of an aging face, and pink on their cheeks to mimic the blush of youth. They are taught these imperatives from an early age. What does it mean that feminine beauty is conflated with youthfulness, but masculine beauty is not? That we want women to be both cute and sexual? It means that we feel comfortable with women who seem helpless and require taking care of. Perhaps we even encourage or demand those traits from women. Perhaps these childlike characteristics are most comforting in women who are, in fact, the least needy. I submit that we are more accepting of powerful women when they perform girlish beauty. When they don't, they are often perceived as threatening or unlikable. So yes, the sexualization of girls is interesting, but it's not just about sexualizing kids early. It's about infantilizing adult women too, as a way to remind women of their prescribed social position relative to men. According to Barkey, whatever else she may become, she is, importantly, a body designed to please or excite. Iris Marion Young adds that women's preoccupation with their appearance suppresses the body potential of women. Developing a sense of our bodies as beautiful objects to be gazed at and decorated requires suppressing a sense of our bodies as strong, active subjects. Hasslinger have explored the idea that objectification is often hidden and masked as objectivity. A plausible strategy for discovering a thing's nature is to look for observed regularities. This is because natures are responsible for the regular behavior of things under normal circumstances. For example, I observe that my ferns die if deprived of water. The above procedure, however, can be problematic. This becomes obvious when moving to the social world. For example, aiming to discover women's nature by following the above procedure in patriarchal societies like ours, according to McKinnon, is highly problematic. McKinnon believes that it is an observed regularity in our society so that women are submissive and object-like, and men are women's objectifiers. This means that one might be led to the belief that women are by their nature submissive and object-like. It should be noted here that McKinnon, also Hasslinger, and Blankton, following her, use men and women to refer to gender categories, which are socially, not biologically defined. One is a woman or a man by virtue of one's social position. However, the belief that women are naturally submissive and object-like is false, since women have been made to be like that. Women's object-like status is not a natural fact, but rather a consequence of gender inequality. Instructing our world in such a way as to accommodate this allegedly natural fact about women, we sustain the existing situation of gender inequality. As McKinnon vividly puts it, if we look neutrally on the reality of gender so produced, the harm that has been done will not be perceptible as harm. It becomes just the way things are. Hasslinger adds, Once we have cast women as submissive and deferential by nature, then efforts to change this role appear unmotivated, even pointless. These reflections suggest that what appeared to be a neutral or objective ideal, namely the procedure of drawing on observed regularities to set the constraints on practical decision-making, is one which will, under certain conditions of gender hierarchy, reinforce the social arrangements on which such a hierarchy depends. Langton agrees with Hasslinger that, under conditions of social hierarchy, the norm of assumed objectivity is problematic and therefore should be rejected. Her reasons are twofold. First of all, as Hasslinger also noted, because it yields false beliefs, beliefs which do not fit the world at all, like the belief that women are object-like by nature. Secondly, because it yields true but unjustified beliefs, beliefs that are true for the wrong reasons. For example, the belief that women are actually submissive and object-like. The belief is unjustified, according to Langton, because of its direction of fit. In this case, Langton explains, instead of men arranging their belief to fit the world, the world arranges itself to fit the belief of men. Those people who occupy a position of power and pursue the norm of assumed objectivity will make the world conform to their belief. 
The fact that men too face pressure to look a certain way and engage in constant efforts to improve their appearance, however, is not on its own sufficient to show that women's and men's preoccupation with appearance is not objectifying. According to Saul, the increasing pressure on men to conform to unattainable standards of beauty is far from a sign of progress. It is instead a sign that the problem has grown. When it comes to the objectification of women, Langton explains that women become submissive and object-like because of men's desires and beliefs. Men desire women to be this way, and if they have power, they force women to become this way. Following the norm of assumed objectivity, then, men form the belief that women are in fact submissive and object-like, and also that women are like that due to their nature. So when it comes to women's objectification, the world conforms to men's minds. Men's beliefs, however, have the wrong direction of fit because men arrange the world to fit their beliefs and desires about women being submissive and object-like. The norm of assumed objectivity, then, yields the belief that women are submissive and object-like, which is true but has the wrong direction of fit, along with a false belief that women are naturally this way. Now that we've heard about how objectification is harmful, let's talk about a report released by the American Psychological Association on the sexualization of young girls. For the purposes of this study, sexualization was defined as being valued for sexuality rather than other characteristics, being objectified, made into a thing to be used for someone else's sexual pleasure, versus uh, being seen as a person with the capacity for independent action and decision making, and uh, sexuality is inappropriately imposed upon young girls. Ample, ample evidence suggests that sexualization has negative effects in a variety of domains, including cognitive functioning, physical and mental health, sexuality, and attitudes and beliefs. The report states, Cognitive and physical functioning. Perhaps the most insidious consequence of self-objectification is that it fragments consciousness. Chronic attention to physical appearance leaves fewer cognitive resources available for other mental and physical activities. One study had girls unable to do well on a math test if wearing a swimsuit versus a sweater. The boys were unaffected by their attire. Sexualization and objectification undermine comfort with one's own body, leading to feelings of shame, anxiety, and even self-disgust. Vigilant monitoring of clothing or appearance leads to increased shame about one's body. Frequent exposure to cultural beauty ideals in the media has been shown to be associated with poor mental health, including eating disorders, depression, and low self-esteem. Studies show a link between sexualization and physical health. Girls who reported feeling negatively about their bodies were more likely to smoke and less likely to participate in sports or athletic activities. Frequent exposure to narrow ideals of attractiveness leads to narrow ideas about actual feminine bodily experiences like breastfeeding, menstruation, sweating, and real sexual experiences. Frequent exposure to fictionalized images of sex made girls and women feel worse about real-life sex. Unlike the previous article, however, this report offers some solutions. Proposed solutions include Formal education about healthy sexual and romantic relationships, things like dating and respect conferences. Comprehensive sex education in hu human biology sense arms girls with the facts about their biological sexuality. Participation in athletics and extracurricular activities not of a sexual nature. Athletics that focus on strength and competence increase self-esteem. Religious and spiritual practices. Girl-centered groups and activities, such as mentoring, Girl Scouts, and girl-related after-school programs. Educating girls about how images in the media are produced and the profit motives behind advertising campaigns. Culture has a meaning. The toys and clothes we allow our children to wear carry significance, and the media they are exposed to has consequences. The statistical evidence suggests that perhaps we, as adults, are not taking it seriously enough. It is our responsibility as the parents and mentors of the next generation to make sure that they're growing up uh, to be better off than we are. In conclusion, thanks for joining me for this LP. It's been quite a ride, and I hope that all the social problems and issues that we've looked at through all these videos have actually had an impact on you. 
um, have brought to your attention the uh, continued problems, you know, that a lot of these problems are still there, they're still happening, a lot of um, bad messages are being told to our children, to our girls and boys about their gendered expectations. And, um, you know, I hope that you take this information and keep it in mind going forward. That's really the most that I can ask. Um, I hope that everybody can take this, these experiences and remember to be more aware of these kind of uh, problems and how they interact with other people in their everyday lives. And I hope that looking at some of this stuff and being more aware of some of this stuff has made everyone... Uh, a little bit more caring about the people that they interact with, a little bit more aware of their own actions and their own words. And I hope that these videos and discussion will encourage everyone to be more empathetic in their everyday life. And I think it's been a whole lot of fun making fun of all this stuff, talking about how stupid it is, and talking about how wrong it is in a public way. And, uh, you know, I hope that as we go forward, we can continue m making fun of stuff like this, and that, you know, as time goes on, looking back on these really sexist attitudes and, um, problematic a attitudes really in every aspect of society that, you know, this is these games that are a reflection of those attitudes. We'll look back on them and still be able to make fun of them and, and more and more they'll be something that used to exist but doesn't exist anymore. Girl games are just a reflection of our society, right? They're the default response that we have when presented with all of these different issues and I hope that by being made more aware of this that you know everyone listening and watching will question those own gut reactions in themselves and help make the world uh, a better place to live in. Anyway thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.